Well, good morning. It's uh, great to be here and great to be at a college that actually believes God's Word, uh, beginning with Genesis. And they're rare sort of colleges today. And uh, so I love uh, being able to be here and to promote uh, Masters University too. And I appreciate so much the bold stand uh, of Dr. MacArthur and the phenomenal ministry uh, there. Well, I come from an organization called Answers in Genesis. Originally, I come from Australia, so I hope I still have that accent. I, I don't want to sound like you, so. <laughs> I, actually, I didn't even have an accent until I came to America, and then they told me I had one, so. Well, the ministry of Answers in Genesis is an apologetics ministry, which doesn't mean we apologize for our faith. It means we equip people to defend uh, the Christian faith. And the ministry of Answers in Genesis has many different uh, facets. We have. Uh, we have all sorts of employees and just about any area you could ever think of. We have a thousand full-time staff and we employ 600 seasonals and we're also looking for internships. I say that because uh, maybe some of you are interested in working at Answers in Genesis and working at the Ark Encounter Creation Museum or during the summer or a seasonal job or when you graduate or being a teacher. We have a Christian school. We're in need of teachers and so it goes on. Well, the Ark Encounter, how many of you have been to the Ark Encounter, by the way? So how many have not been to the Ark Encounter? The uh, Bible's right, you know. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. <laughs> you realize uh, the Ark Encounter is actually the biggest timber frame structure in the world. And we have a 2,500 seat conference center there and a science lab and other workshops rooms. And then uh, as you go into the Ark, we have, it's a wonderful family friendly place with a wonderful playground for kids. We have a virtual reality ride, better than Disney. And you sit in those seats, put on the glasses, you go back to the time of Noah, actually, and then come back to the present, one of the best uh, uh, restaurants, uh, biggest restaurants in America. And Dr. MacArthur is eaten there, actually. And um, then we have a zoo at the back. Uh, and the reason we have a zoo, we're teaching from a biblical worldview perspective. And then the ark itself, 3.3 million board feet of timber, it's one and a half times the length of a football field, half the width of a football field stands. Seven stories high at the midsection, 10 stories at the bow. And the whole purpose is to answer questions, to teach apologetics and present the gospel of Jesus Christ, point people to the truth of God's word in the Bible. Between the Ark and the Creation Museum, we get over one and a half million people a year uh, visiting those uh, facilities. And very, very different to a place like Disney because it's much higher quality. And we teach the truth as well. <laughs> So I encourage you uh, to come out there, or maybe you want to work there and uh, be a part of that. And then 45 minutes from there, my favorite place is actually the Crazy Museum. I'll just show you a shorter video of that. Uh, but it's a whole walk through the Bible, makes the Bible come alive. Uh, we have a planetarium that has a laser projection system, and we have a 4D theater. You put on the infrared glasses. And we have all sorts of exhibits teaching you the whole history of the Bible, for instance. You walk through uh, from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, we present the gospel clearly. We have, one, we have the most powerful pro-life exhibit, I believe, in the world. Dinosaur exhibit, Israel exhibit, and uh, others as well. By the way, did I tell you that we need staff? Uh, so <laughs> we have 90 full-time positions going right now and 600 seasonal positions and internships. So, you know, at a college like this, people who believe God's word, maybe you want to think about uh, a career there. Well, I want to talk about a message from this book. It's one of my latest books called Divided Nation, Cultures in Chaos in a Conflicted Church. And actually, I was at Chino Hills uh, speaking yesterday, and we sold out of most of the material that we brought, but we have a number of these left. And for any of the books that are out there, including this one, uh, we're actually giving to you as Bible college students, because we know you have no money, uh, and you live in California, which means you have less than no money. Uh, so we're giving you those at 70% off, which means $5 for any of, of the books there, and, for, and this one here, which I believe has, is a cutting edge message for the church. In fact, the illustrations I use are in here, and there's a link at the front where you can download those illustrations in PDF, JPEG, Keynote, PowerPoint, so that you can go and preach these messages. That's what we're going to do, equip you to go and give these messages. We have all sorts of cultural issues today. I'm sure you're familiar with moral relativism that is permeating the culture, gay marriage and the gender issues, abortion issue and so on. And Christian researcher George Barner talks about Generation Z. 
and I'm sure that a number of you are in, in Generation Z, and it he says they're the first truly post-Christian generation. Fancy saying that in America, that we now have a totally post-Christian generation, twice as likely to be atheist as any previous generation. One of the latest pieces of research that I um, was able to get from the Cultural Research Center uh, in Arizona was this one, 39% of 18 to 24 year olds, so sort of a mixture of Z, Generation Z and also millennials, self-identify as LGBTQ. 39%, and you realize, wow, this, this culture is changing. But not just the culture, we have problems in the church. Let me tell you one of the major problems in the whole Western world, actually. You know what church attendance is in England right now? It's down to 4%. What about America? There's an incredible exodus from the church. Do you know how many people attended church in the 1700s in America? It was about 75 to 80%. But I've been looking at church attendance statistics for the last number of years, and I just updated them here. Uh, this one here from the Pew Research Center, and they divide people into generations depending on when they were born. And so the greatest generation, born before 1928, um, you have about 51% that are attending church. But as you come down here, baby boomers, 38%. And as you come down to the younger millennials, older millennials, this sort of includes some of the Generation Z as well. Look, look what's happening. There's a generational decline in church attendance. And this is the latest I was able to get from 2021 from GSS Data Explorer. Look where Generation Z and millennials are at down here. And people, we are losing the younger generations. And not only that, there's other issues that we have, LGBTQ and the church. Uh, this uh, research from just recently and from 2021, 27% of those 18 to 37 year olds self-identify as Christians, self-identify as LGBTQ, but you notice something, 29% of those who self-identify as non-Christian also identify that way, which means there's really not much difference between those who say they're a Christian and those who are not uh, in these generations. So there is something really catastrophic happening here. In fact, I believe that you could describe our culture this way. In Judges 21, 25, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what is right in his own eyes. You know, when people ask me, what has happened to America? I say, it's very, very easy to understand. You take generations through an education system. You teach them the Bible is not true. You teach them naturalism as fact, evolutionary naturalism, which is atheism as fact. And you tell them there's no God, then who decides right and wrong? They do then ultimately anything goes. It's all subjective. Moral relativism will permeate, which is exactly what we see happening uh, right now. And you know, it's interesting because I've spoken to some of these people like from the LGBT movement and they'll say to me, but you Christians are intolerant. You give hate speech. All we want is freedom for, for all views. And I say, no, you don't. You don't want freedom for all views. That's all we want. We just want freedom for all views. Well, what about the view based on the Bible that marriage is a man and a woman and there are only two genders and here's what's right and here's what's wrong? Oh, they say, you're being intolerant, you're not allowing our views. Wait a minute, you're not allowing our views, <laughs> based on the Bible. See the clash? See, it's a worldview clash because the, the, the problem is actually a deeper problem. It's a foundational problem, which I want to talk about today. You know, the, the issues continue to rise, as we see in our culture, and there's many of them now. In fact, sometimes I see words I've never heard of before. I, I never heard of these as teenagers, and yet, look what we see permeating the culture. And here's another problem with what well, I find much of the church. A lot of people in the church say, how do we deal with these? And I've had people say to me, oh, you know, we've got to deal with this issue, this problem and this problem, you know, the abortion problem, the gay marriage problem, we've got to deal with uh, transgenderism and so on. But what they need to understand is this, and what many people haven't been taught to understand is they're all the same problem. They're not different problems. They're the same problem, right? They're symptoms of the problem which means the solution is the same. And what's the solution? See, what it comes down to is this. We have a clash of worldviews in our culture because there are two different foundations, and that's what I want to talk about today, man's word or God's word. And we have increasing numbers in our culture that are trusting in man instead of trusting in God's word. And you know, you see that battle all through the Bible. In fact, it's portrayed as light and darkness. Build your house on the rock, build your house on the sand. Those who are for Christ, those who are against, those who gather, those who scatter. In fact, if you look at Genesis 3.15, which is really a promise of the Messiah and the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, that battle has been raging ever since. And that's what the rest of the Bible is all about. And that's the battle that's raging 
raging today. And what I want people to understand is that these moral issues we see today are symptoms of the problem that they build their worldview on the wrong foundation. And to solve this issue, people need to trust in God's word and build their thinking on God's word. Until that happens, we're never going to deal with the issues up here because it is a foundational problem. In other words, the solution has always been the truth of God's word and the saving gospel. Now, I have people say to me, okay, but why is this happening? But you see, what's happening today has been happening for 6,000 years. It's just we're seeing it more today because the veneer of Christianity that sort of permeated the culture somewhat has been ripped away and ripped out of the, the public education system. 6,000 years ago, approximately, when God created everything, he said it was very good. But he said to the first man, Adam, you can eat of all the trees but one. If you do, you'll surely die. In other words, obey God's word. Well, what happened? The devil in the form of a serpent came to Eve and said, did God really say? Stop right there for a moment. Do you, re do you understand what the first attack was? The first attack was on the Word of God. It's interesting, the ministry of answers in Genesis, many people think, oh, they're on about creation, evolution, or the age of the earth, or something, and fossils. You know what we're on about as a ministry, and I've always positioned the ministry this way, the authority of the Word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, it's all an authority issue. And here we see the devil wanting Adam and Eve to doubt God's word so that doubt would lead to unbelief so they would be their own God to decide right and wrong uh, for themselves. You know what's interesting? We know that Adam sinned and we sinned in Adam. And really Genesis 3, 1 and 3, 5, I believe, really sum up the sin nature of man. You know, we have a problem. You know what our problem is? We'd rather put our faith, uh, put, put our trust in man's word instead of God's word. I see that a lot in Christian colleges and seminaries and Bible colleges and churches with Christian leaders who would rather trust man's word in regard to naturalism and evolution and millions of years, man's word in regard to origin than instead of trusting the word of God. And we want to be our own God and decide right and wrong for ourselves. You see, what started to happen back then it was this battle between man's word and God's word, a battle between two religions. Ultimately, there are only two religions. You know, we can talk about the hundreds of different religions in a sense that are based on man's word, but in an ultimate sense, there are two. And if you jump over to the New Testament, it's interesting, because in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul has a warning for us. And I'll paraphrase it this way. I want to, I want to warn you that the devil's going to use the same method on you the same method on, on your kids, grandkids, for uh, those who have had families or are contemplating families and so on. He's going to use the same method as he used on Eve to get us to a position of not believing the things of God. What was that method? You see, one of the things that we need to be saying to ourselves is this. If we're being warned in God's Word that the devil's going to use a particular method to get us away from believing God's Word, we better know what that method is. And what is that method? It's an attack on the Word of God to get us to doubt and not believe the Word of God. I call it the Genesis 3 attack. And you know, the Genesis 3 attack has happened ever since Genesis 3. But it manifests itself in different ways in different times. And the question I have for us is, how does the Genesis 3 attack manifest itself in today's world, in the era we live in? How does it manifest itself? See, if you think about it, you know, when Peter and Paul were preaching about the resurrection, do you think anyone came up and asked them about, you know, carbon dating? Well, no, because that's a 20th century invention. Do you think when Martin Luther was nailing those theses on the door of the church in the 16th century, someone come up and said, do you believe in dinosaurs and did they go on the ark? Well, the word dinosaur wasn't invented till 1841. And it's basically a, a, a term for a number of different kinds of animals that God would have created and so on. That's a whole other issue. The point I want to make to us is there's always been attacks on the Word of God that have, be, have had to be dealt with down through the ages. But what is the Genesis 3 attack of this era? And I believe the Genesis 3 attack of this era really began in the 1800s to the present. And it's an attack that, unfortunately, much of the church and many of our, our church leaders, and not all, of course, but many have succumbed to. I've traveled around the world for the past 40-odd odd years. And you know what I found? It doesn't matter what country you're in, you can be in a third world country. When people know you're on about the Bible and the gospel, they tend to ask the same basic questions. In this era, they would say, well, wait a minute. 
don't we live in a scientific age? Hasn't science disproved the Bible? How do you know the Bible's true? What evidence is there for God? Who made God? You believe in Adam and Eve? Where did Cain get his wife? How did all the races come about if there are only two people to start with? Where's the evidence of the flood? Don't fossil layers prove millions of years in evolution? We know man evolved from ape-like creatures. How could the story of Adam and Eve be true? Well, wait a minute. How could Noah fit all the animals on the ark? Didn't dinosaurs live millions of years ago and evolve into birds? How could Noah fit all the animals on the ark anyway? Um, there, but there were too many of them. You know, hasn't science proved evolution is true? Isn't the Bible an outdated book of mythology? Just for interest, how many of you have heard those sorts of questions? Oh, that's a shock. <laughs> well, no, it's not a shock. Because they're the sorts of questions we hear today. Because what you just told me is you understand what some of the Genesis 3 attack, attack questions are of our day. Now, the next question I have for you, and, and don't answer, just sit there and think about it, can you answer those questions? Now, at, at a college like this, I would expect that many of you would be able to say yes because you'd be taught the answer to those questions. But you see, most people in our churches can't answer those sorts of questions. And then I challenge them. Have you taught your children to answer those questions? Have you equipped them to make sure they're ready for the world they're living in so they're not going to be led astray? You know, we have an incredible problem in the church. And we see the exodus of the younger generations. And we're seeing a very lukewarm church in many instances. You know, now, obviously, there, there are a number of exceptions, of course, and exceptions associated uh, with, with Grace and Masters University and so on. But the majority of churches have become very lukewarm and not really having the impact that they should, not making the bold stand that they should. What, why are we in this situation today? I, I believe it's because much of the church and our leaders have, have succumbed to the Genesis 3 attack of our day. See, if you go back to the 1800s, there were atheists and deists who were popularizing naturalism, and they wanted to explain everything by natural processes. And so they said that the, the, layers, the layers of rock uh, with the fossils, well, there's no flood, the Bible's not true, therefore they were laid down millions of years before man. But you know what started to happen then? For instance, Thomas Chalmers, founder of the Free Church of Scotland, great, great Christian man, but he succumbed because he said, you know what we can do? We can take those millions of years and put them in a gap between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 and basically formulated this gap theory that got into the Schofield Bible and permeated many colleges and churches. How many of you have heard of the gap theory? Yeah, I think we've all heard the gap theory. And then, you know what happened? Uh, there, there were those that said, well, we'll fit them into the days of creation and then we'll reinterpret the days. Uh, and, and then all sorts of other different positions came about as people tried to fit the millions of years in. Along comes Darwin, popularizes ideas of evolution. And there were church leaders that said, we'll say God used evolution. So you've heard of theistic evolution. Along came the Big Bang. And the other uh, Christian leaders said, you know what, we'll say God used the Big Bang. And before long, you start to get all these different positions on Genesis permeating the church. You know, I've been to churches where I've been told, well, one of our elders is a gap theorist. Well, our pastor tends towards progressive creation of Hugh Ross or something. Oh, oh we, have, we have some people in the church that have theistic evolution. They say to me, what's your position? And I say, oh, the biblical one. <laughs> because all these, do you realize all these different positions on Genesis? You go and check it out. Every single one of the positions on Genesis, except taking it as written, all have one thing in common. Trying to fit millions of years into the Bible taking man's view of origins and trying to force it into the Bible. I was on a radio program once. It was with a Presbyterian minister, actually. And he said to me, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, you must admit we've got lots of different denominations, you know, in our churches and different positions. I mean, in eschatology, there, there are positions of pre-mill, post-mill, R-mill, you know, windmill, treadmill. There's lots of different <laughs> positions. Uh, different positions on baptism, immersion, sprinkling, different positions on speaking in tongues, Sabbath day. I said, yeah, okay. And he said, there's different positions on Genesis, same thing. I said, oh, no, oh, no. And if you can understand this, you'll understand really the burden we have at Answers in Genesis for what has happened. Because, you see, when you're arguing about issues of eschatology, baptism, speaking in tongues, or whatever, primarily, and obviously not everyone can be right, right, but regardless, primarily you're saying, but the Scripture says here, yeah, but over here it says this. Yeah, but in context here it says this. You're primarily arguing from Scripture. 
But the reason we have all these different views of, of Genesis in the church is because they're saying, because of what the scientists are saying, because of, because of what these scientists over here are saying, because of millions of years. Because, in other words, they're starting outside of Scripture to take man's religion. You know what evolution of millions of years, you know what that really is? It's the pagan religion of the age to try to justify explaining life without God. And they're taking that pagan religion and they're adding it into the Bible and undermining the authority of the Word of God. I mean, that's really what's happening. And I wanted to give you some practical examples. Now, I'm always fearful of doing this. I'm, I'm going to show you some video clips of uh, some people. When I do this, I'm not attacking them personally. But you know what we need to do? We need to make sure that we judge what people are saying against the absolute authority of the Word of God. That's what we need to be doing. Because I find today that, you know, I've, I've even found so many young people in our churches, they say things like, well, I feel if, if, if a man and another man love each other, they should be able to get married. But wait a minute, they should be taught. It's not a, you can't trust your feelings. It's not a matter of your feelings. And anyway, the Bible says the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So you can't trust your feelings. They need to be taught that the, we have the absolute authority of the Word of God, and that's what we use to judge what people are saying or their behavior or whatever. But sadly, because many of these young people in our churches, what's happened is they've been told by many of their pastors and others, Oh, you can believe what you're taught at school. That's okay. Don't worry about it. Genesis is not important. Yeah, we need to take what scientists are saying and we can reinterpret Genesis. That's a, just trust in Jesus, Johnny. But, you know, they start to realize if the first part of the Bible can't be true, how can the rest be true? And by the way, once you unlock that door and say you can take what man, fallible man is saying from out here and reinterpret God's word in Genesis, why shouldn't they do that with marriage? Why shouldn't they do that with gender? Which is exactly what's happening in much of the church. I want to give you a practical look at what I believe is a major problem, catastrophic problem that permeates most of the Christian colleges, seminaries, Bible colleges, churches, not this one, but uh, there are some like this that stand on God's word as they should. But as I said, they're the exception, not the rule. Some of you may have heard, who's heard of Dr. William Lane Craig? Oh, a lot of you. Okay. <laughs> So Dr. William Lane Craig um, is, uh, actually has his own uh, organization called Reasonable Faith. He's said to be a great apologist of our age. In fact, he's looked up to by many seminaries and Bible colleges. Um, he is professor of uh, uh, visiting professor at Talbot School of Theology associated with Biola, because there's a lot of professors there who would not agree with our position on Genesis because they believe in millions of years and so on. And he's professor of philosophy at Houston Baptist University. So, in 2009, let me uh, show you what he's saying. How old is the world? The best estimates today are around 13.7 billion years or so. Now, this is good, you see. I, I, this is a position I can embrace because there are people who, who will sit here and say, no, it's six and a half thousand years old. Um, that, that is not a terrible position? I don't think it's plausible. Uh, the, the arguments that I give are right in line with mainstream science. Uh, I'm not bucking up against mainstream science in okay. presenting these arguments, but I'm going with the flow of what contemporary cosmology... You notice what he's saying? See how he used the word science? In 2014, I debated Bill Nye, Bill Nye the science guy, really, Bill Nye the atheist guy, but uh, I debated him at the Creation Museum, and the first thing I did, because Bill Nye was portraying this battle we have as science versus the Bible. And here's the problem. I said, people need to understand what the word science means. And the word science means knowledge. And I said, here's the point. You can have knowledge you gain by your five senses that builds technology, and we can all agree on that science. That's called, we call it observational science um, or operational science. Or you can have knowledge about the past when you weren't there. That's historical science. That's the origins issue. The problem we have today is that you will find the secularists use the one word science for origins and science for your technology or experiments in the lab or whatever. 
And people are indoctrinated to believe, well, wait a minute, if scientists who invented all this technology are using the word science for millions of years of evolution, I can't give up science. They don't understand that you need to, you need to have, an, have a real comprehension of what the word means, and there's a difference between beliefs about the past and what you can experiment with your five senses in the present. So I explained that at the Bill Nye debate. One of the problems I've seen is so many of our theologians in, in many of our seminaries and, and colleges across this nation, they have capitulated to this and they'll say, because of what the scientists are saying. Now, William Lane Craig is saying, because of science, what, I'm not going against, against what science is saying, but he's talking about scientists, talking about the Big Bang, billions of years, which is beliefs about origins. That's not empirical science. And so what he's really saying is, I'm going with the flow of what fallible man says about origins, I'm not going with what God's word says. Therein lies the problem with much of the church. Now, one of the things I've been saying for years is once you st open that door and start adding millions of years into the Bible like that, eventually you'll give up biblical authority. Eventually you'll give up the book of Genesis. Let's see where William Lane Craig is today, 12 years later, or a bit over 12 years later, and uh, he just published a, a book recently, and he was interviewed about this book. I would be disingenuous, Sean, if I were to say I don't want the young earth creationist interpretation to come out true. Okay. Uh, to me, that is a nightmare. Uh, my, my greatest fear is that the young earth creationist might be right in his hermeneutical claim mm -hmm. that Genesis does teach those things that I described earlier. And I say that would be a nightmare because if that's what the Bible teaches, it puts the Bible into massive, I think, irredeemable conflict with modern science. If you believe the Bible is written in Genesis, that puts it in conflict with what he calls science, but he's, it's, it's to do with origins. We can't have that, therefore you can't believe the Bible. He should be saying, therefore we can't believe what man is saying. He's saying the opposite. And it's been a problem in the church, and it's a problem that has permeated uh, Christendom. About the matter of Adam being made um, from dirt and Eve being formed from one of Adam's ribs, are those elements uh, part of the myth in the mytho history, or do you think they're historical? I think that is part of the figurative language of myth. I have long been uh, suspicious of things such as the creation of Eve from a rib out of Adam's side as though God performed some sort of literal surgery on the man and built a woman out of it, or that God shaped this figurine out of dirt and then breathed into its nose the breath of life and the statue came alive. It seemed for, to me that this was clearly figurative language. I shouldn't have to say much about that here, right, at this college? I think it should prompt us not to be over-literalistic in the way we read these narratives. And once you begin to look at them in terms of mytho-history, it's difficult to look at them in any other way. Mm. I mean, when you read a story about two people in an arboretum, with these magical trees whose fruit, if you eat it, will grant you immortality or knowledge of good and evil. And then there's this talking snake who comes along and tempts them into sin. And then you got this anthropomorphic god walking in the cool of the garden, calling out audibly to Adam in his, in his hideout. You think, well, of course this is figurative. Uh, and metaphorical language. This isn't meant to be read in this sort of literalistic fashion. And so once you begin to see these narratives this way, I think you, you begin to ask yourself, how could I have read them any other way? It would be like reading Aesop's fables literalistically as really about talk. So if you believe in literal genesis, it's like taking Aesop's fables literally. And what does he mean by mytho-history? You know what he means? It's myth. That's what he means. Because that's what it really is saying. People, do you realize he was mocking the account of the creation of Adam and Eve? He was mocking and mocking the fall, the way it's put, given in the Bible. He was mocking that. 
And then, okay, one last one. I know you're tired of these, but one last one. Now, assuming then, for the sake of argument, the truth of evolutionary biology uh, and certain human origins, we can imagine sometime prior to 750,000 years ago, a group of hominins, uh, maybe a, a few thousand, and through a biological and spiritual renovation, perhaps divinely induced, a, a miracle that caused a genetic regulatory mutation in a pair of these hominins, they were lifted to fully human status. You know what? I would rather believe God's word that he made them directly from dust and made Eve directly from uh, Adam's side than this nonsense. People, this is a problem. It's permeated the church. And just to give you another, just another example real quickly, um, take one of the biggest churches in America uh, with Andy Stanley. We really believe, whether you take it literally or figuratively, whatever. If we really believe that God is the creator of the universe, that all time, space, and matter, all time, space, and matter were created by God, and we take seriously what science has told us, that it all began with a singularity, that's what it's referred to, right before, there's not such thing as before the Big Bang, because before is time, and time began. So if we go to the singularity that was the Big Bang, that unfurled the universe, that continues to expand, and when religion and science conflict, at the end of the day, if you are an honest person, science must win. And I can assure you, those were, those were not taken out of context. You can listen to all uh, uh, the teaching yourself, which we have done. And people, it's a problem in the church because they're elevating man above God. And they're using man's fallible words to reinterpret the Word of God. It began in the 1800s in this era, and it's been undermining the authority of the Word of God. And we've had more and more Christian leaders that have capitulated to compromising man's Word with God's Word. And we've told generations of kids that the Bible's not true in Genesis 1 to 11. And they've walked away from the church. What can we do about it? Well, I want to um, suggest to you two things. I, I, I list five in the book, uh, Divided Nation, but I want to list two things in particular that I believe there's been great failure of in much of the church. One is to raise up generations thinking foundationally. What do I mean by that? Where does, your, where does your thinking come from? Where does your worldview come from? You don't just pluck it out of the air. Your worldview has a foundation. It's either God's word or man's word. And as Christians, we need to be raising up generations on the foundation of God's word and beginning in Genesis 1 to 11. Because one of the things I want to show you is that Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for all doctrine, for the rest of the Bible, for our worldview. And if you haven't raised up generations on the foundation of Genesis 1 to 11, no wonder they're led astray by the world in in regard to marriage and transgender and abortion and, and everything else. No wonder they walked away from the church. And the second thing is apologetics. 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to make a defense or answer, which comes from the Greek word uh, apologia, from which we get our word apologetics, which means a logical reason defense of the faith. There's been a great lack of teaching of apologetics in our churches and, and, and in many of our colleges and, and Christian schools and so on, to be able to equip people with answers to the Genesis 3 attacks of our day that cause them to doubt and not believe the Word of God. And so what I want to do was to just give you some examples of what it means to be thinking foundationally and using apologetics. It's what we do at the Ark Encounter. It's what we do at the Creation Museum. At the Creation Museum, a centerpiece of the exhibits is the seven C's of history. We have lots of other exhibits too, but we walk people through Genesis to Revelation. And there was a burden I had going back to, to the 70s when I began uh, teaching actually, and, and, and speaking in churches, and, and I saw that for many people, they were trying to grapple with how do you deal with evolution and creation and this issue and gay marriage, and, and they're trying to grapple with all these issues and death and suffering and so on, and I realized because they're not starting with what God has revealed to us in Genesis, then, then to them, they're just issues all over the place, and they're all different problems instead of symptoms of having the wrong foundation. And so, we developed the seven C's, and when you look at them, the first four, creation, perfect creation, corruption, the entrance of sin and death, and the promise of the Savior, catastrophe, the flood of Noah's day, and then the Tower of Babel, 
The first four C's, that's Genesis 1 to 11. It's the history in geology, biology, astronomy, anthropology that's foundational to our Christian worldview. It's foundational to all of our doctrine. It's foundational to everything. And that's what much of the church has missed. And no wonder they don't know how to deal with these issues. No wonder people are, are, are lukewarm. And they're not equipped with answers and they get intimidated then. They get intimidated by people who, uh, who oppose them. And that's why many Christians don't want to go out and witness to others as well because they feel like I won't be able to answer the questions and they don't really know why they believe what they do. And so I'm going to ask you a question and then you're going to give me the answer. And I'm going to make it easy for you. I'm going to ask you a number of questions and the answer is the same for every one of them. That should be easy for college students. And then I'm going to give you the answer anyway so that you can remember it, all right? Here's the answer. You start with Genesis 1 to 11. So what's the answer? Start with okay. How do we deal with gender? What's the answer? Start with Genesis 1 to 11. Okay, let me, let me show you this. So you start with Genesis 1 to 11. God created man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. It's interesting, I don't see any other options. In fact, when you go to Genesis 5, it says male and female, he created them. All through the Old Testament, you see phrases like this, male or female. Jump to the New Testament. Jesus, as the son of God, the God-man, when asked about marriage, actually quotes here the text of Genesis 1.27. Haven't you read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And again in Mark 10.6, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And here's the thing that I, I, I say to, to parents and others as I, I have presented to them. I said, look, do you realize... If you get rid of all outside influences, okay, if we truly believe this is the Word of God, if this is a revelation from God to us, He's the one who knows everything. We know nothing compared to what God knows. And He's revealed to us this key information in here as the foundation for our worldview. Then, if you just start from Scripture, there's only two genders for humans, male and female. Do we stand on that? Do you teach your children that? Now, it is good to have some uh, apologetics, and we also need to know what the world is going to say and how the world attacks, and so it's good to have other information as well. So we know that uh, from observational science, uh, we know that life is built up on that molecule of heredity, DNA, which makes up our chromosomes, and humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, and males have a pair of sex chromosomes, females have a pair of sex chromosomes. In males, they're X and Y. In females, it's X and X. Oh, there is science confirming the Bible. Amazing. I wish they would follow the science. Aren't we told to do that all the time? I don't see a lot of politicians following the science. But then people will come to us and they'll say, ah, but... There are some people that have three X's, and some have two X's and a Y, and there's these other things as well, and so... And actually, that's true. But it's only a biblical worldview beginning in Genesis that explains it. And by the way, what percent of people have problems like that in those chromosomes? It's like 0.06%. In other words, it's minuscule, it's tiny, which means there must be something else going on here. Oh, we start from Genesis 1 to 11, we live in a fallen world. It's no longer a perfect world. And now because God placed upon us the judgment of death, Romans 8 tells us the whole creation's groaning, so now uh, things are running down and we run down and uh, when uh, genes are copied from one generation to the next, there can be copying mistakes, mutations, and you can end up with all sorts of problems in all sorts of chromosomes causing all sorts of issues, but none of that negates the created order. And that's the point. See, we need to make sure that we're equipped and, and we're preparing people with the right foundation. Okay, how do you deal with marriage? What's the answer? Start, Start from Genesis 1 to 11. God made man from dust, not from an ape man. William Lane Craig was wrong. From dust. In fact, the Bible says from dust we come and to dust we return when we die. We don't return to some ape man when we die. And then God said, it's not good that man should be alone. In other words, you see, um, when God made man, um, there were no others made in the image of God, only humans. 
So that's why God brought the animals to him to name, to show him there was none like you. Only man was made uh, in, in, in the image of God. He didn't look at a female chimp and say, you know, she's close enough, I could date her or something like that. <laughs> so what did God do? He put Adam to sleep and from his side he made a woman. Actually, go to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 11. Twice in that chapter, Paul says, woman came from man, not from an ape woman. You can't add evolution to the Bible as many Christian leaders have tried to do. And then Adam got all poetic and romantic. And he said, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She'll be called woman because she was taken out of man. You know, I tell the guys, hey, Valentine's Day comes around, if, you know, if they haven't cancelled it by then. But take your girlfriend or your wife out to a nice restaurant for dinner, sit them down at the table, look them in the eyes, rip off the mask, make sure it's the right woman. <laughs> Nobody two years ago would understand that, but at least you understand it. And then you look at... You look at her and you say, I want to be like Adam when he was perfect. You are bone of my bones. You are flesh of my flesh. You are woman. Anyway. Are you, you... So let's go to the next verse. Therefore, this is the reason a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they'll become flesh. If you look at Genesis 2.24, you know what that is? The creation of marriage. Who created marriage? God created marriage, not Joe Biden or the Supreme Court justices, right? God created marriage, and there's only one type of marriage. In fact, in the New Testament, Jesus, and we had this verse before, uh, when asked about marriage, said, haven't you read, he was made in the beginning, made the male and female, Genesis 1.27, and therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they'll be one flesh. That's Genesis 2.24. There's Jesus attesting to the historicity of Genesis as the foundation for marriage, and there's only one marriage, a man and a woman, which means there's no such thing as gay marriage. Now, if I write about gay marriage, I put marriage in quotes. They can call it gay union or whatever they want, but there's only one marriage. It's a marriage God created. Comes from the Bible, back to Genesis. In fact, you know what's interesting? Ultimately, every single biblical doctrine of theology, directly or indirectly, is founded in Genesis 1 to 11. If what I'm saying is correct, and we've had generations of people in our churches and the majority of our Christian leaders have either ignored Genesis 1 to 11, haven't taught it, or compromised it with evolution in millions of years. I've even had some conservative pastors tell me, I'm not really game to teach on Genesis much because it creates division. I have people in my church that believe in evolution and so on. You know, people need to have courage and stand for what the Word of God teaches and be bold about it. And if, you, if we've had generations like that, then they're going to be in a mess in, in knowing how do you deal with all these different issues and moral issues. They won't really know why they believe what they do. They won't be able to defend it. See, think about it. Where's the origin of death? Genesis 1 to 11. Sin? Genesis 1 to 11. Why does man have dominion? Genesis 1 to 11. Doctrine of work? Genesis 1 to 11. Seven-day week? Genesis 1 to 11. God made everything in six days and rested for one. Why is Jesus called the last Adam? Genesis 1 to 11. Why did he die on a cross? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we need a new her heavens and new earth? Genesis 1 to 11. I notice you're all wearing clothes, which is very good, but <laughs> the animals don't wear clothes. Why do we wear clothes? God gave clothes because of sin. Genesis 1 to 11. Do you think Genesis 1 to 11 is important? And yet, think about it. That has been so neglected by much of the church or compromised or ignored. No wonder we've got issues. Okay, how do you deal with abortion? Okay, what's the answer? So God made man in his own image. What's that got to do with the abortion issue? Everything, because only humans were made in God's image. How did God make the animals? Let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to their kinds. How did he make man? He said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And by the way, the next part of that verse, we could have another hour on that. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and so on. Man was given dominion over the creation. A lot of our politicians have the creation having dominion over man. And you know, one of the things that we've got to recognize too is that when whatever a person's foundation is determines their worldview. So if our political leaders have the wrong foundation in regard to history. For instance, take climate change. You know, people ask me, do you believe in climate change? Sure, I believe in climate change. There's been climate change ever since the flood. It's caused all sorts of climate change. But if you believe in millions of years and 
you have a whole different worldview in regard to this and what happens and so on, you're going to make the wrong decisions. It's the same when it comes to environmental issues. You see, we need to understand everything natural is not good. We live in a fallen creation. And God has given man dominion. It doesn't mean we abuse the creation. We need to look after it. But there's a whole uh, worldview of, of having a biblical environmental worldview based on God's word that we need to be making sure that we develop. But see, the emphasis today is that man is just an animal. And that's what the world wants our kids and others to believe. We're just an animal. We're no different to the animals. In fact, if you go to the Cincinnati Zoo, we're in northern Kentucky, and if you just go across the river uh, to the Cincinnati Zoo, um, they teach that when you visit the ape exhibit, you're visiting your family. <laughs> to look around the room, that makes sense. <laughs> now, they have their assign, and they quote Jane Goodall, who did a lot of research on apes. We are not, after all, the only beings with personalities, rational thought, and emotions. There is no sharp line dividing us from the chimps and the other apes. Uh, we humans are a part of and not separate from the animal kingdom. So, so the world's emphasis today is you're just an animal. You know, get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids. What's the difference? You know, it's interesting. They say there, there's no sharp line dividing us from the chimps and the other apes. I don't know. Every zoo I've gone to has a very sharp line uh, <laughs> dividing them. And I want to challenge us, a little radical thinking here. Because of the way the world is indoctrinating our kids, why should we not separate man out to be separate from the animals? Because we're humans made in the image of God and make that the criteria. I understand we have a body like a mammal's body, but the world's emphasis is we're just animals. And so I think we have to respond to that, make sure that we're teaching a proper biblical worldview. Now, we know in sexual reproductions, you get one set of DNA from the male, one from the female, fertilization. This is a little bit of the animation from our fearfully and wonderfully made exhibit at the Creation Museum, which is an incredibly powerful exhibit. And at fertilization, what happens, you have a unique combination of information different to any other human being ever. And as that cell then begins to build our body. No new information is ever added, which means you are 100% you, human, right from fertilization. Which means what? Abortion is killing a human being right from fertilization. Now, um, as you, as you uh, think about all that too, consider what God says in Psalm 139. Wonderful Psalm to read. Fearfully and wonderfully made knit together in your mother's womb, and then this phrase, when I saw your unformed substance. Even when your body wasn't formed, it was you. You, a person. Because right from fertilization, all the information that builds you, right there, you're 100% human. What does God's word say? Do not murder. You knitted me together in my mother's womb, fearfully and wonderfully made. Wow. Now, what's the world saying? Because we need to make sure we're prepared for it. I'm sure you've heard this. Our bodies, our rights. <laughs> you heard that, haven't you? Just recently, the uh, Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris, she tweeted this. The right of women to make decisions about their own bodies is not negotiable. The right of women to make decisions about their own bodies is their decision. It is their body. <laughs> Interesting, it seems to apply to that issue and nothing else. You can think about that. <laughs> But is it their body? Well, no, it's not. I mean, a fertilized egg that's male, where did the Y chromosome come from? Not from the woman. That's not a part of her body. And not only that, did you know that a woman's body actually looks on a fertilized egg as foreign tissue to reject? Just like if you have a kidney transplant, your body recognizes the foreign tissue, you have to take anti-rejection drugs. God built an anti-rejection mechanism into the uterus so it could develop. Wow. Wow, absolutely phenomenal. And you know, I had a young lady that was at the Creation Museum. She came to me one day and she had tears in her eyes and, and she said, you know, I was brought up in the church all my life and nobody really ever explained that about being made in God's image and different to the animals. And I was never told about DNA and the unique combination of information. And what if someone like me has had an abortion? And I said, well, we also need to understand the grace, mercy and forgiveness and the love of God too. Because, you know, I said to her, you know what God's word says? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He promised us to remove our sins as far as the east is from the west and remember them no more. And then she got a big smile on her face and said, thank you. 
See, what a difference when you teach the right foundation. And you know, when you come to the creation, when you come to the creation museum, uh, you'll see this fearfully and wonderfully made exhibit. We're actually uh, tripling the size of it this year. And you'll be able to see all those models right from fertilization. And you'll be able to see the organs inside the models working. It's got to be absolutely phenomenal. OK, this one then, because we're getting close to the end here. We always say that so that people think you are. So <laughs> isn't that what teachers say, pastors say? <laughs> so how do you deal with death, suffering, and disease? You, you got to start with Genesis 1 to 11. You know one of the most asked questions from young people today, how can there be a loving God with all the death and suffering in the world? Well, see, the origin of death is in Genesis. When you walk through the Creation Museum, that second sea, corruption. See, God said everything he made was very good. But Adam, if you disobey, you will die. Adam disobeyed. There's the origin of sin, the origin of death. Now the whole creation groans. What was God's response? He made garments of skins and clothed them. There's the origin of clothing. And at the Creation Museum, we have the sacrifice scene, the first blood sacrifice, the covering for their sin, a picture of what was to come in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's, it's looking to the one who will, who will come, God setting up that sacrificial system. And, and we look today and understand how we need to be clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. So why the shedding of blood? Well, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Death was the penalty for sin, so the giving of life has to be um, given uh, so that there can be payment for sin. And the Bible says it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away a sin because we're not animals. We're not connected to the animals. A man brought sin and death into the world. A man would have to pay the penalty for sin. We're all descendants of Adam and Eve. There's only one race, by the way, because we're all descendants of Adam and Eve, one race biologically. Um, and we're all sinners. So God steps into history in the person of his son to be the perfect, sinless uh, God-man, to become of Adam's race, to die on a cross, be raised from the dead, and offers that free gift of salvation. Wow. See, the whole gospel message is right there founded in Genesis 1 to 11. I've had pastors tell peop people today, when you go out and evangelize, don't mention Genesis, it's too controversial, just tell them the gospel. How can you tell them the gospel without Genesis? And increasingly today, we have generations who don't even understand sin. They don't, don't even understand uh, the Bible. They've been taught against the Bible. And then if you think about people like William Lane Craig and, and Andy Stanley, but it's not just them. There's professors at all sorts of colleges, whether it's Wheaton or Calvin or Biola or you, know, you run across the country. And they will teach students you can believe in millions of years. Well, the idea of millions of years came out of atheism and deism, particularly atheism. And they believe those layers were laid down millions of years before man. But if you as a Christian believe in millions of years, you know, in the fossil record, there's lots of examples of animals eating each other bones in their stomachs. But the Bible says originally Adam and Eve were vegetarian and so were the animals. In fact, as humans, we weren't told we could eat meat until after the flood. When in Genesis 9, 3, God said, um, just as I gave you the plants, now I give you everything. That's the reason you can eat a hot dog, because it is everything. Do you realize even the origin of a hot dog is in Genesis 1 to 11? <laughs> if you believe in millions of years, do you know what else is in the fossil record? Lots of documentation on diseases in the bones. Think about this. Diseases, tumors, cancers, arthritis, abscesses. Oh, there's lots of papers on this. If that all existed before man, and then after God created man, he said everything he made is very good, then God's calling cancer and all those diseases very good. That doesn't fit, not with what, who God is. That means these two things can't be true at the same time. You can't have millions of years of death and disease leading up to man and man's sin leading to death and disease, which means those layers of fossils couldn't have been laid down over millions of years. Oh, hmm, well, how do you explain fossils? Okay, how do you explain fossils? Do you start with... Oh, Genesis 1 to 11, if there really was a global flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. You know what you find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Very quickly, I don't have time to deal with this one, just really quickly, and then we'll finish. How do you deal with racism? You start with that fourth C, confusion, the Tower of Babel. You take the Bible's history. God made Adam and Eve. We're all descendants of Adam and Eve. 
which means if we're all descendants of two people, Adam and Eve, how many races biologically are there of humans? One. Two spiritual races, the saved and the unsaved. But biologically, there's only one. Then why do we talk about races? So many churches talking about races. And you know, as you go through the history, there are eight people on that great ship. And when they came off, you know what it says in Genesis 9? The sons of Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. The Bible makes it clear. All human beings on earth today are descendants of those three sons. And what happened is about 100, 150 years after the flood, there's an event called the Tower of Babel. God gives different languages so as people move away from each other because of the genetic diversity they have, depending on who marries who, who dies out, how isolated they are, you'll end up with different, different characteristics on the outside that dominate particular groups, but they're not different races, they're different people groups. And one of the things we see today, even with... Um, you know, critical race theory that's even being adopted by many of our churches. When people ask me, what do, you, what do you do with critical race theory? Here's what I say. Number one, is the foundation man's word or God's word? What is it? It's man's word. It's not God's word. So therefore, that tells you right there the worldview is going to be wrong. And you look at the worldview, what are they teaching people? Judge people according to their outside. The Bible says people need to be judged according to their inside, their heart, who they are against the absolute authority of the Word of God. And then they divide people into the oppressed and the oppressors, into black and white in particular, is what they do here uh, in America. But here's the interesting thing. Did you know there are no black people and there are no white people? See, people look at me and say, you're white. No, I'm not. I can prove to you in less than a second I'm not white. This is observational science. I'm not white. <laughs> You know, we have pigments in our skin, and the main pigment we have is melanin. Melanin, uh, it has a couple of forms of it, but it's it, uh, a brown color. And, of course, there's lots of genes involved. And this is very simplistic to give you the basic principles. If you had big A, big B, meaning lots of melanin, little a, little b, meaning a little bit, you can be, uh, if you had all big A's and big B's, you'd be very dark. That's not black, it's dark brown. Little a's and little b's very light. It's not white, it's light brown. The majority of people in the world are middle brown, if you're going to divide people into black and white, where do you draw the lines? Because you have all those shades in the world. See, what a difference when you start with the right foundation to have the right world view. And uh, understand, by the way, there's implications here. You know, for instance, um, if there's only one race biologically, there's no such thing as an interracial couple because we're all one race couple. There's no biracial people because we're all one race. We're all Adam's race. What a difference when you start with the right foundation. And you know, there's one last thing I want to say real quickly, and that is, it's, I sum it up with these two diagrams. It's a battle between God's word and man's word. And the devil knows, how do you knock out that castle of Christianity? You knock out the word of God, so to speak. You attack the word of God. And in this day and age, the attack has been leveled at Genesis 1 to 11. Many in our churches, unfortunately, have also undermined Genesis 1 to 11. And people look up there and say, look at all the problems we've got to deal with in the culture. But they're not the problems. They're the symptoms of the problem. And so what our ministry is all about and the books we have and the attractions is to help raise up generations with the right foundation, beginning with Genesis 1 to 11, have the right worldview to understand why they believe what they do, equip with answers to be able to, attend, uh, to defend the Christian faith and to deal foundationally with the issues, only then can we start to deal with them. And you know, when, when you're talking to somebody, I've had a person at a conference come up and said, I'm gay and I believe in gay marriage, what do you say about that? And I said to that person, well, I'm a Christian and I start with the Bible. You know what he said? Well, I don't believe the Bible, don't give me that stuff. And I've had many people over the years say, what do you do when people don't believe the Bible? Well, here's the problem, if you give up the Bible, you've given up your foundation. So when they say to me, I don't believe the Bible, you know what I say to them? Well, I do. <laughs> and then I, I say to them, why don't you believe the Bible? Is it because of what you're taught at school? You think science is just through the Bible? You sort of bait them because you know what they've been taught. How do you decide what's right and what's wrong? Why, should somebody else, why shouldn't somebody else decide what's right and what's wrong? How do you know that what you're saying is true? What do you believe about where you came from? If you don't get the battle down to the foundational level, you're never going to be successful up here. And that's the bottom line. Because people trust in man, that's why we have all these issues. We need to do our best 
to point people to the Word of God, to trust the Word of God, and then build their thinking on the Word of God. Well, um, what I said to you today in more detail is in the book Divided Nation, and as I said, all well, these illustrations are there, and uh, you can download uh, the illustrations to go and teach the message yourself. A book that follows on from that, Gospel Reset, How to Evangelize a Culture That's Changed Foundation. And we have a few other books out there, Glass House, all the classic arguments for evolution used in schools and colleges refuted. My son-in-law and I put that together. One of our new non-controversial books, uh, The Gender and Marriage War, everything we could think of in there. And this one's all about the family and uh, a lot of testimony and how do you raise godly children, roles of men and women. And did I tell you that we need staff at Answers in Genesis? And uh, with that, uh, thank you for the invitation to speak to you and I'll hand back for whoever's closing.